the hell you guys are located in this crazy world as I keep telling you. I'm Al Din. I'm with Underground Noise Webzine. This is webisode number 70, the last one of 2022. Today, I've got the pleasure of interviewing Chris Dawson from Elusive Travel and also from the band called From Astral Planes. Welcome, Chris. How's it going today, sir? Good. How are you? Um, happy almost New Year. Um, great to finally reconnect after all these years. How are you today? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing good. Awesome. It's been a long time since I've yeah. seen you play live. Yeah. When um, Did you ever go to Winbreed shows and stuff like that? I went to The Haunt. The Haunt. Oh, okay. Yeah. No shit. Yeah, I think we played... Um, well, I don't think Winbreed ever played there, but Elusive Travel played there in 2005, I believe. That's and then we the went show. to Carl's, the radio station app. Did you go to the radio station with us? No, I, I only went to the haunt to see you guys, and you guys kicked ass oh, that night. Thanks. Actually, Carl has a video of that, too. That's really? uh, That was it. Yeah, there's actually a video. I'm pretty sure it's still online, too, yeah. If if, if you know, um, well, I call him Carl. It's Sarai Asgath, yeah, from um, uh, Last Exit for the Lost. So I've known him since I was in, like, high school. So, yeah. So his nickname is Carl. That's a no. It's the opposite. His oh. real name is Carl, and his like his, I don't know if you want to call stage name. He's not a performer, but for whatever reason, he chooses to go by Soraya Ascath. I don't know. Probably because when you have a zine and you give someone a bad review, and maybe they get mad and want to find out who you are and kick your ass. I don't know. <laughs> you know. So, anyways, <laughs> so yeah, Carl's uh, Soraya is 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 a great guy. He does um last exit for the loss. They've been doing it for. I know I'm going to mess this up, at least probably 30 years. Um, they actually do, um, they have a radio show um, called Last Exit for the Lost, Fields of the Nephilim, you know, um, you know, playing words or whatever you want to call it. Um, and um, they actually have bands play live in the studio. They actually moved the studio, got a new studio maybe five years ago, I think. Um and now they actually have uh, like a really cool band room and maybe once a month or something like that, or maybe they actually will do a live band. Um, we do want to get out there and play. It's just that his, his hours for his radio station are like Saturday at midnight. So it's like, okay, you got to pack all your stuff uh, and start driving at what 11 p.m you know and what i'm almost 50 so it's like dude that's like you know <laughs> i mean i stay up late sure you know but it's like that you got to drive an hour over an hour away play set up and then you're done by what 3 a.m or something i don't know and then you drive back i mean that's i mean i, I could definitely do it uh the younger the people in my band are actually younger a lot younger than me um actually my drummer mike adams he's i think he's like 34 um he used to play drums in order the dead he's been with me for about a year and then we just got a, a new bass player i believe he's 24 um his name is kurt um he hasn't been in any bands he's actually from cleveland um so uh yeah so we have pretty much a whole new lineup basically i have never really stopped since 2000 when i started the band so i moved to cincinnati in 2000 came back to rochester in 2007 um it took a couple of years to to find at least even just a drummer you know because when you're advertising for this type of music it's like it's either too heavy for some people or too light for the other people so i've always wanted to do a sort of a mixture of being able to go from really brutal to very mellow and it's a lot of people aren't able to diversify or they don't really understand what I'm doing. Like I've been sort of wanting to do something like this since Winbreed left, uh, since Winbreed broke up in 96. So I always like a lot of alternative rock and stuff like that, like Smashing Pumpkins and um, Dinosaur Jr. and Radiohead. But I always love like Suffocation, obviously, and um, Morgoth and Asphyx. Like I really got into like the, the, first, the first wave of early 90s death metal. And I will always love that stuff. But I sort of found like, there was an emotion that sort of was missing from the death metal that I wanted to create, but also there was like a melodic part that was missing from the death metal that I got from alternative music, I guess you would say. And then I got into doom metal and then it kind of just melded into what it is now. So sorry for the long winded answer, but. Oh, that's quite all right, man. What I'd like to ask you, uh, what song or songs off of soul desertion did you find to be your favorite? Uh, probably nights because, uh, you know, it's funny. 
I don't ever do the lyrics a lot of times until I get to the studio. Um, and some people don't like that as far as like when you're working within a band context. <laughs> well, last time we didn't like that because he was like, oh, I don't know what to play, where you're going to sing. I, I guess I kind of understand that too. Um, but I sort of look, I, I just do it in processes. Like when I write the music, um, like I generally write most of like, see, people will say, write the music. Um, so generally I come up with 95% of all the riffs, you know, but I always in a band context, arrange it. And then I always take suggestions from people in the band too. So, you know, maybe I write, come up with like the riffs, but we all um, arrange it together. You know, um, I like that um, sort of arrangement doing it that way. So I'd say nights. Um, and then because um doug white who records us most of the time at watching studios he added a really cool guitar counter melody um i don't really play lead i can play like a little kind of counter melody stuff a little bit but he does it way better so i just let him do it um and um then all of a sudden just that one little lead just gives me goosebumps changes the whole song and then when i add the lyrics on top of it um all of a sudden it just it goes from just a song like that i like to just like magic to me so i'd say nights because of like the ending chorus at the end it repeats like three times um that was probably my favorite part and you know it's funny a song like follow the pisces which actually it's weird like it didn't come out as good as i thought it would like at practice it was like goose bumpy because it's like an ebo in the beginning and then i mean it's it's fine on the album but for me I, I was sort of expecting that one to be sort of like my favorite and it was now it's end up being like my least favorite and then nights is sort of like my favorite and i didn't expect it because sometimes like i said songs change when you just add the lyrics or just add one little counter melody or you know we don't add keyboards until we get to the studio so i think things change sort of at the last minute for me so i'd say nights is probably my favorite yeah that's really cool. I like that one. And I also like the first one, Wolves. Yeah, Wolves is one song that we do actually have in our, our quote-unquote live set right now. Um, that's actually the song we start off with. Um, I've always, you know, like in the beginning of the band, we used to, you know, writing music in, in a band, it's, it's never really super easy generally because – unless you're like Kurt Cobain or like someone who can write a whole song from beginning to end lyrics and everything. And I've been in the band with people like that where I play drums and it was awesome because we'd have like four songs in one new in one week. And it was like amazing. I think everyone suffers. I don't want to say from writer's block, but they suffer from like, it's just hard to write songs fast because, you know, when you're, you know, in your forties or thirties, you know, life is like, you know, you got it, you got work. Maybe some people have kids. You're not practicing two or three times a week. Like I did when I was in Winbreed, you're practicing once a week. So, um, you know, I don't like to do arrangements really until I get with the band. So I just write a bunch of riffs and then I go, Hey, here's what I got. And then we all kind of put it together. I, I suppose there's some, there's been some times where I've demoed stuff, um, and that's that's fine too um but uh i guess i'm a little lazy so i know like i get in the room and then mike my drummer has a lot of really cool ideas too so i'm always just like well oh, here's my riff i got i have sort of like a rough idea but what do you think and then we just kind of mash parts around and then and i've always sort of done it that way um it's sort of like a throw it against the wall to see if it sticks and if it doesn't you know um i guess maybe it's sort of a sloppy way to, to for songwriting you know i've known some people that are like can read music and I've been in, I've had people in the band where it's like they read music and then, you know, they want to think about it and they don't know if C is going to go into F minor, right. And then they're analyzing it. And I'm just like, well, let's just play it real quick to see if it fits. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. And some people like to work differently. Like I've had members like that. And sometimes it's actually, uh, it's more difficult because I don't know how to read or write music. I mean, I, I know how to write music, but I don't know how to read music. So I'm like, oh, uh, what? What do you mean? So, yeah. So I'm sort of a hack, I guess. So it kind of sounds like a like a foreign language almost to you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I can actually kind of relate to that because I write music, up, uh, you know, by myself as well. And I'm working with a guy in Colorado named Brendan Jackson. Shout out to my homie, Brendan. Uh, we're doing a project called Nightmare Trip. And... Uh -huh. Basically, he's handling the bass tracks and the drums and also doing the mixing and mastering. 
and I'm handling the vocals, lyrics, and guitars. And whenever it comes to writing riffs, I just come up with whatever, you know, and if it sounds good to me, hopefully it sounds good to the next person. But if not, that's okay. I don't so know what do I'm playing. Do you just send him like um like an audio recording of the riff and then he Oh, okay. Yep. Do you guys that's... use click tracks and stuff or no? Um we should, but the only problem oh, with me curious. is I don't I don't even follow a metronome properly. I have a hard sure. time trying to keep in time, so I just come up with whatever and just crunch it out, you know. Yeah, we just so. started using click tracks, like it's something I had never done before, but um I wanted the band to go in a more atmospheric style and I really wanted keyboards and just it's not even so much Rochester or Cincinnati where I was living, but keyboard players are so hard to find, first of all. And then finding one that wants to play an atmospheric doom progressive like post metal, like like they're gonna be like, What? You know what I mean? Like I, I know like actually my I do so the guy who plays keyboards for us just does it in the studio. Um, so actually, um, when you first announced um, from Astro Planes, we actually that band actually did break up a while back, unfortunately. Um, uh, but I'm in another band called Paro, uh, P A R O. Um, I've been doing that for about almost three years. Um, we do have stuff on Bandcamp, so it's all we have almost ten songs recorded. There's about seven on Bandcamp right now i play drums and the guitar player plays uh keyboards and loose travel like in the studio so he's actually a really fantastic keyboard player um but um you know i you know he only really wants to just kind of be in one band it's pretty much all he can kind of handle so he so i don't want to like bother him to be like because honestly the click tracks are you know like i said i'm 48 years old and there's a lot of people have um a very strong opinion like oh it's cheating oh don't do that it's like well it's we're not lip syncing you know it's like there's no keyboard player on stage pretending to play obviously if you hear keyboards and you don't see a keyboard player you know it's a backtrack so i i really have embraced the technology um we even play at practice with a little click in our ear just to keep us in time and i used to hate that in the beginning because it was like oh I'm, it's going to be distracting but actually it's gotten me a lot tighter and i don't even I don't even like notice it now. Um, so we have yet to play out um, with this lineup, but we did with the last lineup. We played about three shows. Um, the drummer used a click, but we didn't, we turned it off because we use IEMs, um, um, you know, uh, in your monitors. So, so yeah, so just have keyboard for backing tracks. And then once we did this last album, like you were, we were talking about what song uh, did I like? So, just that one little guitar counter melody was in there. I decided that I wanted to throw in a couple of those counter melodies that Doug White did. And obviously, you know, there's no one on stage just playing that other guitar. So it's like, it's just to really bring, you know, that sound you hear on the album as close as we can live. And it's not because we don't want a live member. It's because we there's we can't find another guitar player. We can't find a keyboard player. And I can go the rest of my life and, and and just play in a very basic, but why the technology is there and I have no problem with it. You know what I mean? I think when you're sort of faking it, like, you know, like you're lip syncing, I think that's, you're, you're sort of deceiving people. I think if people, you know, uh, so many bands use backing tracks just for like bare minimal stuff, like Catatonia, one of my favorite bands, they've been using keyboard backing tracks forever you know and i think there's nothing wrong with it obviously like i said you're not lying you don't see a keyboard player pretending to play um or if you know some bands they have a little orchestration part and they want it in the song you know i think you do whatever makes you happy so that's that's the thing that we've been doing actually before we found our bass player we had a bass on the backing track because we we wanted to practice with the sound of the bass and we almost were like gonna go i guess it's gonna be a two-piece you know i guess you know um Maybe we'll have a backing track for bass. And I was a little unsure about that, like, you know, but luckily we found a bass player. Um, he's pretty good. He's never been in a band before, but uh, he's he's moving right along really fast. So we do have a backing track for keyboards and for a couple guitar, little counter melodies, you know, but I mean, everything else is live. So um, since I moved back to Rochester, we haven't really played out. We've only played out, I think, three times. Um, so 
back in Cincinnati, we used to tour. We played Milwaukee Metal Fest, you know, um, Cleveland Death Fest. We played um, James Murphy. Like um, we did like a, a um, what do you call it? Oh, benefit for him. Yeah. And uh, Michigan, um, we toured all the way down to Carolinas, to New York City, obviously to Milwaukee. And so we played all over the place on the early 2000s when I lived in Cincinnati. Um, but when I got home, you know, it took a couple of years to find a drummer and stuff like that. So um, and then the drummer I was with, he didn't really he wasn't really much into playing out as as i was so i didn't want to force it too much but now that i have um the people that i'm working with now it's like we're definitely going to do some shows you know it probably won't ever be as much as it used to be um you know but uh i guess you never know i mean if there's offers to do something like a really cool one-off i'm totally down for that but we'll probably just play local and just release music and to me the most important thing nowadays is like releasing albums like and not five years from each other. Like every year, every two years, I like to release a new CD. And CD is something that I'm very proud to release. So, absolutely. Who came up with the band name Elusive Travel? Was that you? Uh, I I did. Yeah, I had a hard time thinking of it. And there's been people in the band that hated the name, and then there's been people in the band that love the name. You know, it's to me, it's not so much. Uh... So first of all, you got to think of a band name that doesn't pigeonhole you. But almost more important, you got to think of a band name no one has ever used before. That's the hardest thing. I mean, if you go on Metal Archives, you look up, you think you might have a cool band name, and there's like 30 of those bands, and they just don't care. So first of all, my, some of my favorite bands is Paradise Lost and The Gathering. So Paradise Lost has a song called Elusive. And when I was like, when the album first came out in 1995, Draconian Times, I was like, what does that word mean, Elusive? I didn't know, you know. So I looked it up and I'm like, oh, hard to find. That's pretty cool. Interesting, you know. And then The Gathering has a song called Travel on How to Measure a Planet. Two of my favorite songs. So in sort of a way, it was like basically what what it means is it's about life. Like you're it's actually it's sort of backwards. So it's like you're traveling through life, but you can't find what you're looking for, but you have to keep moving. So I, I found this like sort of beautiful happiness whenever I drove from Cincinnati to Rochester, whenever I traveled around, I just felt free and it felt, uh, I felt very happy. Um, so it was sort of like, you're, it's like, you're never finding really true happiness, but you're, you don't give up. So you're traveling. So it's sort of like, it's just sort of means like the journey of life to me is sort of like what it means even though no one would ever get that from elusive travel it sort of doesn't make english grammar sense like i can't find where i'm going well that's sort of that is sort of like what it means you you're never finding that happiness in life but you're not giving up but you're also moving at the same time and you're moving through life and so that's that's what the band means to me so you know that's really cool it sounds like i heard your cat yeah you did yeah it's funny, like, uh, I, so I, I'm a huge cat lover. Um, I don't know if we're friends on Facebook. I don't. Yeah. Oh yeah, of course, of course we are. Yeah. Um, so I have a cat. Uh, I have a cat named Pothead, an orange cat, <laughs> and I don't even smoke pot, but it's a funny name. And I have a cat named Luna, and that's that's who you heard. And I, I think she's like, I think she sees a bug or something. So she's usually very quiet. It's usually Pothead is the one that likes to make the noise. So yeah, I got yeah. two cats. Well, what I could do later on is I'll send you a picture of my cat. His name is Frostburger. Oh, <laughs> what kind of cat is he? He's a he's a snowshoe Siamese. He's got you know white feet, so it looks like oh, he's wearing, it looks like he's wearing gloves or mittens sometimes. Oh, that's so cool. Oh, I dude, I I know I used to be allergic to cats. You know, I'm I am like obsessed with cats. Like, of course, I mean, so many metal dudes. You know, a lot of people are, but it's funny. Like most metal people fans are like there's this uh, company called uh not a company there's a nonprofit called feed the beasts in chicago they have um i wish i had one of the stickers with me it's funny one of the cats um uh they actually you know what i'm gonna show you real quick i don't know if you can i don't know if you can see it hold on so all i see is a blue background yeah, I know. I don't know how to get rid of this fucking blue background. Is it one of those green screens or is it immersive? 
it's you know so yeah i, I was trying to show you but it, it's hilarious it's this black metal cat it says feed the beast on it and um it's like a really cool sticker i can send you one if you want they actually yeah. have stickers and, and all kinds of merchandise but i got a whole bunch of their stickers it's really cool you know i tried to turn off the so I, when i went to this background it says background and it was already on none so i hit none and it it didn't turn it off so i'm in this <laughs> i'm in this i got no arms and i look fat you know <laughs> I was about to say, where'd your arms go, bro? I know. Look at that. Look, oh, there Mom, you go. No hands. Look at that. I just, like, look at my belly. It's actually, it's actually, I'm actually sitting in my chair. So, dude. <laughs> I know. I should, great. I should go into comedy. You know. <laughs> you might as well try it. You know. I mean, it, I matches, I... it matches my coffee cup. Oh. You see. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, people ask me, what's with the elephant in the background? I'm like, hey, it's my favorite animal. I'm sorry. They're just really strong. I love <laughs> elephants. My grandma used to have these collection of elephants. Like when she, when I was a kid, I'd always look at them like, these are so, like, just majestic. And as I got older, I learned about them. But anyways, back to your questions. Yeah, I've only got 10 minutes left because I sure. don't have premium. But my next question would be, uh, how long did it take you guys to produce, get the whole album done? Uh, soul desertion. It was probably about like a year and a half about. Um, and that was really only due. Um, the drummer at the time, um, he bought a Roland electronic kit and he wanted to record the drums himself. And really, it took him a long time to learn how to use the program. Um, you know, he was very particular about how he wanted his drums to sound and this and that. Um, and it, unfortunately, it sort of, you know, it made the process much longer than it needed to be. Um, um, so probably like, I think a year and a half, uh, but we recorded everything all at once pretty much. Um, but it was like waiting for the drums to kind of like waiting for my former drummer to learn how to use the program, then to record the, the drums that took about a year and a half. Um, but that's something I don't have to you know, deal with anymore. Um, I mean, it, it, they came out okay. You know, they're not bad. Um, some people say like, they're actually like, they're actually drum samples. They're actually samples of really real drums. Um, but Mike, my current drummer, he just, we just go down to watch studios, go down, bring his drum set, boom, bang it out. Like one day, all the bass and tracks are done. I go back a second day and do that and the vocals and then it's done so it's like we're on a much faster turnaround time like within the first couple months of the band mike um me and mike went to the studio recorded three songs and then it, like you know and then i i booked the studio date because doug the producer he's like booked three months out so if you book you book in january your next date is going to be march or april so it's sort of like we got to wait work around his schedule so um i can't really take off like a whole week worth of work you know all at once and stuff like that to come up with all that money it's expensive you know so so we um so yeah so a year and a half but this is going to be we're already six songs in and we'll probably do at least three more so i can't really say when the next album will be done because i thought it would be done sooner but so much happened over the past year like my drummer moved my van got stolen we lost our bass player um so a lot of stuff, crazy stuff happened throughout the year, but now we're, everyone's really close. So we got to write about three more songs, record them. I'd say probably by the end of 23, we will have a new album out, um, maybe even sooner. I'd always like to say it's later and then impress people if it's sooner. I mean, we could probably easily get it done by the summer, but we want to, I always like to press CDs, you know, so real CDs, not CDRs, so takes yeah. time and it's, it's expensive so but yeah this next question i have for you i've never asked anybody this question but when it comes to shows i can understand when people throw their horns up in the air they shake their fists like this and they're headbanging or they're in the mosh pit what's up with the middle fingers why uh -huh. do people have to be like that why do they have to send up their middle fingers like this are they trying to tell the band members f you or what is it are you talking about when people give the finger in the pit or just in photos um basically like if a band's on stage and they're just like this right in your face giving you the oh. finger i don't know if they're trying to say fuck you or they're trying to cheer you on or what i never understood it i have i don't know i've only 
seen that maybe a couple times. I have a singer from, I used to be in a band called Fledgling Death. Um, one of our singers, Jay Galvin, he sort of had this crazy punk attitude, like a Gigi Allen, like he, you know, like an anal cunt, like he likes to torment the crowd a little bit. And I sort of thought that was kind of funny because I wasn't used to that in my metal. You know, it's you have a different kind of posing and posturing. So um, I think maybe it's, I don't know. I mean, I think it's just maybe just teasing the crowd to antagonizing, but I don't really see it too much in metal, um, to be honest with you. Um, I don't go to as many shows as I used to. So um, because oh, not a lot of good bands come here. I mean, in Rochester, it's like there's not a lot of funeral doom or european metal you know it's swallow the sun came here and it was like amazing catatonia came here you know 2011 that was really cool um harry curry for the sky unrequited and i think ghost bath is coming to rochester in um april and i'm sure they're coming they're coming all around the u.s it's like uh it's like black gaze you know you might like it it's like it's like uh not like dimu borgir symphonic black metal much more orchestrated like un unrequited it's from uh california it's a one-man band you should check it out you might like it it's very cool it's unlike anything i've ever heard what's the name of it again unrequited i can uh, send you um uh, a link uh when we're done i can send you a link yeah that'd be awesome I yeah they're that. touring with Harry Curry for the sky or Harry Curry from, from, the, uh, from the sky. Uh, I think they're like from Utah and some other, they're sort of like a little bit like wolves in the throne room. If you've heard them before. Yeah. Yeah. I have. Yeah. Actually. They're like a little bit kind of like that in that sort of vein, but then they take it a step further. So yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. What kind of, what kind of guitar do you like to use to make your sound? Uh, I've been as S920. It is a, roughly $1,500 Ibanez premium. I like really thin six pound guitars. I use um, the Line 6 Helix. Sometimes I use the Line 6 Veta. I love amp modeling. I love effects and stuff like that. Yeah. That's really cool. I use an Ibanez myself. I've got an Ibanez seven string. And then I oh. also got an Ibanez eight string too. I love Ibanez. I have a I have a Schecter eight string that someone left me in their will. Um, it's pretty cool. It's it's crazy huge. You know, I would love to do some down tuning. I've all, I, I still have yet to do a, a funeral doom project. I really want to do it, but there's like nobody in Rochester that's interested in that. So it's like, it's like basically just me. So, uh, but I did do a project with a guy called uh, Dea, D-E-H-A. He, um, he lives in Belgium. Um, I believe he's uh, Romanian, I think. No, Bulgarian, sorry. I think, yeah, he's Bulgarian, I believe. Um, but he lives in, um, yeah, he lives in uh, Belgium now. Uh, we did a, a Torture Doom. I'll send you a link. I actually have one CD left I could send you. Um, this dude does about like 30 albums a year. Wow. <laughs> it's crazy. He's got about 176 albums. And I think he only started recording maybe less than 10 years ago or something like that. He's the most prolific ever he actually sang on uh metal gaze and he sang on waves he did the backups he did the clean vocals someone that doesn't sound like me singing clean that's dea yeah he's okay. really cool you got to get into him he's awesome he does yeah. the funeral doom band slow s-l-o-w you should check okay. that out too yeah i actually mentioned him in my review i don't know if you had a chance to check that out or not but i, I did. mispronounced I did. his last name called yes. him yes. like what yeah. <laughs> it could be it could be Deha. Uh I, I say Dea, you know. Yeah. But it could be I've never heard him say it, so you know, so but yeah. You could be right. Could be either way. I mean, <laughs> you're probably be like, nope, yeah. you're not saying it right. I'm not Deha, but I will no. laugh with you. <laughs> Maybe he's Deha. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'll have to ask him. Yeah. Absolutely, man. Well, hey, Chris, I appreciate your time today. Um sure. I'd like to tell you thanks for being on my show. Do you have any last yeah, words for Underground Noise Webzine? Um, I think it's cool that people uh, are still doing them, um, just independently doing, you know, that's awesome that you're still doing this. That uh, Worm does this, uh, Penyana, if you remember Worm, um, he he does this uh, thing called um, uh, the Wormhole. I don't know if he still does it as much anymore, but just it's cool that you guys still do stuff like this. I remember back in the 90s, just, 
tape trading and, and doing, you know, sending letters and stuff like that. So thanks for having us. It's cool that you do stuff like this. It's, it keeps the tradition alive of, of underground metal. It keeps it going. So it's awesome. Thank you. And uh, Lucid Travel will uh, hopefully be playing out this summer, I think, you know, maybe by fall. And we'll have, uh, we, we do have CDs and shirts right now. If anyone's interested, $5 and $15 for shirts. So we got stickers and buttons we'll give you for free if you're interested. So uh, you can find us on um, uh, Bandcamp, uh, Elusive Travel One, uh, Bandcamp.com. Awesome. Thanks, well, brother. Everybody. You're welcome. Okay. Well, everybody, keep your horns up. Support Underground Noise Webzine. Support Chris Delson and his band, Elusive Travel. I'd really appreciate it. And if you're new to my channel, please subscribe. Also, share it with your friends, like it. And also, Happy New Year to all you metalheads yep. and rockers out there and whatever kind of music you like. It's all good in the hood, right? Happy New Year, guys. Yep. Metal. I got I, no hands. <laughs> yeah. All I saw was a pinky like that. And I'm like, oh, I got this. A... Yeah. I got this. <laughs> <laughs> you can't say yes you without a smile, can you? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, brother. I'll talk to you. All right. Sounds good, bud.